If you're interested in waterfall photography from a unique perspective, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Kirby Flanagan, and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer. Today's guest, Jimmy Breitenstein, is a professional wildlife photographer as well and a naturalist who pushes the boundaries of wildlife photography. In this episode, Jimmy discusses with me the use of floating blinds to get up close and personal with waterfowl. Be sure to stick around to see some of Jimmy's great photos. Welcome back, Jimmy. Thanks, Kirby. It's a pleasure to be back on with you. Uh, it's always fun on my end as well. So how did you get started using uh, floating blinds? So kind of uh, interesting, actually. I got I first started using float floating blinds not for waterfowl or bird photography like they're usually used for. Uh, I was actually out trying to photograph a family of North American river otters, and I was just having a really hard time getting pictures of them uh, from the best vantage point possible. Uh, everything, it was just always obstructed in the area that I was seeing them uh, frequent. So uh, one day I was sitting out there in the rain and I just thought, you know, the best angle to get these guys is probably going to be from the water but I need to be hidden while I'm out there. So I uh, thought about, well, I'll try using a floating blind and see how that works. And it, it actually didn't work at all for the otters. They were very <laughs> suspicious of it. But while I was out there trying to get the otters, I noticed that these birds were swimming within just feet of the blind uh, so close sometimes I couldn't even focus on them. And some of the birds would even land on the blind. And uh, so that's how I started using a floating blind to photograph birds. Wow, that's quite a story. <laughs> so do you use commercial blinds or did you make your own or how, how do you do that? So I'm pretty uh, cheap most of the time or frugal, I guess you could call it. But uh, the uh, commercial blinds tend to be a little bit pricey. So uh, you know, I, I like to make things anyways. I figured that I would make my own and that way I could make it to whatever specifications that I needed and make it big enough for the gear that I bring, all that. So uh, I do make my own uh, floating blinds. So how do you go about doing that? So one day uh, I just drew up. I mean, I'm not, I enjoy making things, but uh, I don't you know, have set plans for a lot of the stuff that I make. But uh, one day I just drew a picture of kind of what I wanted it to look look like. Uh, took some measurements of how much space I needed for my gear that I wanted to take with me. And uh, just kind of did some research on different materials that uh, might be better in the water and uh, keep me and my gear safe while I'm out there. And uh, so after I had drawn those plans up. I made the base for it uh, pretty easy. And then uh, the hardest part for me to make was the cover that goes over it just because I don't have really any sewing experience. Uh, but I made a custom camo uh, cover out of nylon that goes over the top. And I just borrowed my uh, mother-in-law's sewing machine to do it one day. And, you know, it worked out great. So uh, it was really just a lot of trial and error putting that floating blind together. And I'm in the process of making uh, number two right now, actually. Uh, so do you use styrofoam or what do you use for flo flotation? So uh, I've got two sheets of plywood, one on bottom, one on top, uh, just to keep it a little bit more rigid and have something to put bolts into and whatnot. And then in the middle, I just threw some rigid insulation foam, uh, which keeps it very buoyant on the water. I mean, I can sit on that floating blind in the water and it carries my weight and my camera's weight. So uh, it's, it's very buoyant on the water with that foam in there. And then to seal everything in, I just got some fiberglass cloth with uh, epoxy that goes over or it's a yeah it's a form of epoxy resin that they use for actually patching boat holes uh when they get some sort of crack or hole in it so 
Uh, it's very waterproof epoxy made for being in the water and uh, it, it works great. So I'm trying to picture this. So uh, how do you keep the water from getting into the uh, foam insulation? So that's where that uh, fiberglass cloth and epoxy come in. I wrap that around everything, anywhere where there's the foam or the plywood. Um, I just wrap that around and the epoxy goes over it. So all those other materials that I talked about, they're all sealed within that fiberglass cloth and epoxy. That's, okay. that's, so that's the outer shell basically. And then everything else is inside. Okay. And then you just paint the epoxy on. Is that, is that how that yeah, works? Essentially. Yeah. You put a layer and then you lay the fiberglass cloth on, and then you put another layer of epoxy over that. Yeah. Okay. Um, what size is it approximately? Oh, uh, the one that I made, the first one that I made was, I think it's about three feet by five feet approximately. Okay. And how heavy and is all that? It's got a rounded front. Oh, sorry. What's that? How, how heavy is all that? It's pretty heavy. The, the first one that I made, it's, it's pretty heavy. And that's actually one of the reasons I'm making a Senkit one is just to cut out some of the weight uh, that I'd don't necessarily need but uh yeah the current one the the first one that i made is probably like 40 45 pounds uh -huh. okay just okay. the base and it, it's bulky so it just carrying it it's not the most convenient thing to carry so yeah the second model that i'm making right now um i've altered quite a few things to it uh where it's going to be a lot lighter and uh, just easier to move around with. Yeah. Well, everything's uh, a process. So I... Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in photography. Yep. So, um, so we talked a little bit about uh, why you use folding blinds, but uh, why don't you talk about that a little more? Because uh, mm -hmm. not everybody uh, does it, but the people that do it seem to be really happy with it. Yeah, it's, it's a great method of photography, especially uh, water birds, waterfowl, like we talked about. Uh, it just gets you a lot lower to the water. So just so you're not pointing down at the bird. I mean, the perspective that you get uh, where you're <clears throat> essentially eye level with that bird, it's just amazing. It's such an amazing point of view that you get. And the majority of those birds that I get out and photograph, like I briefly mentioned before, they have no idea that I'm there. They'll come within feet of the blind. I've even had some land on top before. And uh, the only time they ever realize something is amiss is when they, if you move the blind quickly, um, they'll kind of clue in that, wait a minute, that, that shrubbery is moving in a way that it probably shouldn't be. Um, or if they see you get in and out of that blind, um, once that happens, you might as well just call it a day because most of those birds out there, once they associate that with humans, they'll leave or they won't let you get close even in that blind. But overall, it's just a fantastic way to get out with the birds and see them behave in a natural way and uh, be able to get extremely close and intimate pictures of the of the birds that you're photographing. So if the, that close, what uh, gear do you use to photograph? So I bring probably more gear than I should actually when I go out in that blind. Uh, like I mentioned before, I made it large enough so I could have a lot of gear in there with me. So. Um, generally I'm in there, uh, with some sort of telephoto lens really depends on the bird that I'm trying to photograph, how big they are and, uh, how close I'm expecting them to be. But, uh, generally while I'm in there, I've got, uh, two different camera bodies and two different lenses. Uh, one of those again, being a telephoto lens. And then, uh, one of them generally being a uh, prime lens. Uh, just to get that really crisp shot. 
and then uh, occasionally as well, if I'm making a video for YouTube or something, I'll have my uh, my shorter vlogging lens as well, so I can record myself taking pictures of the birds and doing that stuff as well. So uh, all that combined with my spare batteries, memory cards, all my other camera accessories, cables, microphone, all that stuff, um, I've got in there with me while I go out to photograph the the birds. Wow. That's, that's quite a setup. Yeah, it is. It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what focal lengths are we talking about? So it really depends on uh, the species of bird that you're photographing. Some of them, even though you're in that blind, uh, some of them tend to be a little bit more flighty. Uh, like I was just out with some pelicans a couple weeks ago and they, the blind made them not nervous. They were just, it, it was just abnormal to them. So they didn't come right up to it like a lot of the ducks and whatnot. So, I mean, I'm shooting anywhere from like 200 when they get really close uh, to maybe 600 or even more if I throw a teleconverter on. Okay. Um, really, really depends on the size of the bird and how close they're getting, honestly. Okay. So typical lenses for yeah. bird photography. Okay. Yep. How do you find places that'll let you use a floating blind? So it's very important, especially if you're familiar with using uh, boats and whatnot in water. Um, it's very important to make sure, first of all, that you can launch a blind there. And uh, most, you know, in my state, for example, uh, most of that information can be found on the state website. And you can see what you need to do in order to launch a floating blind or something in the water. Uh, it needs to be clean. Uh, you, know, you need to be cleaning it after each source of water that you visit just to stop the spread of uh, waterborne, you know, parasites and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, some places are going to require permits for you to get into. Uh, I was just out last week in the area I was photographing in. I needed a permit for, so I had to go through the process of doing that. So just do your research as if you were taking a boat out in a lot of those places, uh, online again they're going to have all that information for you and uh, sometimes for something like a floating blind because it's not big enough they won't require you to go through a permit process or something like that but uh, it, it'll it'll say online so just research the body of water that you're going to be visiting and see what requirements there are from whatever agency manages that body of water and uh, you know there's just a lot of things to consider when taking the blind out uh, again, you know, we've kind of touched on permits, stuff like that, but you're also going to want to do research on how deep the water is. If you're in a river, how fast is the flow rate of that river? Uh, if it's a larger body of water, are there uh, waves or boats that go nearby that'll create, you know, waves, different things like that. It's, there's just a lot you need to consider when taking the blind out that you really wouldn't think of initially. Yeah. So uh, do you have uh, better luck with uh, things like state parks uh, as opposed to uh, national wildlife refuges or state refuges? Um, let me think. I've, I've gone to one state park with the blind before, and it, that was easy. There wasn't anything special that I had to do. I just had to go in and, uh, you know, clean the blind off and they, they checked it before I launched it. Nothing too rigorous. Um, the wildlife refuges, the, I prefer those because there's less people, but at the same time, it can be a lot harder to find an adequate place or an easily accessible place to launch the blind from. Uh, I, I've hiked with that blind for about two miles once to get to a spot to launch it from. And with it being so bulky and heavy, it, it, it wasn't the funnest of experiences. <laughs> but guess not. <laughs> but I mean, it, it paid off. I, I had a great time out there and it was worth it for me. But you know, there's pros and cons to using them in the different places. Uh, like I say, ease of access at your 
state parks or more public areas is always nice, but you might have a lot more people that potentially could scare the birds off or, you know, a lot more human noise that, that you'll get in those places. Whereas some of those more remote areas, uh, it, it might be more difficult to get set up out there. But once you're out there, it's just an amazing experience because it's, it's just you and the birds and it's, it's awesome. Yeah, a lot of, uh, or a lot of the refugees I've been around anyway, uh, don't even allow boats except uh, during certain very restricted times. So, yeah, okay. and that's where it comes, you know, that's where it's very important again to research where you're planning on using it because, you know, if you just go, if you're driving down, you know, some old dirt road and see a nice pond or something and you think, oh, I'll just go set up there, but you don't know if you can or not, you can, you can get a nice citation for something like that. So, uh, it's very important that you're researching where you're planning on setting up and, and make sure that that you can set up there. Yeah, for sure. So um, how do you get into the blind, I guess, would be the next question. So this is another reason I'm building a second one, because... Uh, the one that I've got now, it's it can be a little bit tricky to get in depending on how deep the water is. But uh, just picture a big oval donut is kind of how I've got the base of my blind set up. And you just stand in the middle and it floats around you. So getting in that thing can be a little bit tricky and I'm not as flexible as I used to be. So you've got the top set up and I have a little... Uh, velcro door in the back that opens and I just step in one leg at a time and you know I have to lift my other leg over to get in and then I close the door behind me and I can float out but uh, depending on how deep or shallow the water is it can be a little bit tricky getting in and out once the uh, camo cover is all set up and and that so uh, again that's another reason I'm making number two right now is just uh i think i'm going to do this one like a big horseshoe just so i can walk right in and close the door behind me instead of trying to finagle you know getting in without dumping all my camera gear into the water <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can see where it would be kind of tricky depending on uh how deep the water is and uh all those kinds of things yeah for sure so do you wear chest waders or how, how do you stay dry? I do. Uh, so I've got some uh, pretty thick chest waders that I uh, wear. And it, I mean, they're pretty big on me. They come all the way up to here. So as long as I'm not in incredibly deep water, uh, I'm totally fine. I've never had water get into the waders before. And again, they're pretty thick just because when you're walking, you know, through a river or something, there's there's going to be sticks and stuff down there that might brush up against your waders, and you want to make sure you've got thick enough waders where you're not going to slice a hole in them, uh, and then have to, you know, bail on your your excursion first thing. So yeah, chest sure. waders, in my opinion, are the way to go. Okay. Do you wear uh, do you wear the kind that have built-in boots, or do you have external boots that you wear? Yeah, they've just got the built-in boots. It makes it easier for me personally where I don't have to, you know, carry or worry about putting on the other boots and making sure it's all watertight and everything. So I've just got the kind that have the built-in boots. Okay. And how do you uh, figure out where to go? Because, I mean, you're going out, even if you've done your research, you don't necessarily know how deep the water is right where you're headed. So uh, any uh, tips on that? <laughs> yeah, a lot of it's just trial and error, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I always try to scout out. If, if I find a place that I think will be good, I always try to scout it out beforehand. So I'll go, you know, the day before. And again, I'll check if it's a river. I want to see how fast the flow rate is of that river. Um, if it's an open body of water, I want to make sure there's no waves or boaters going around, things like that. Uh, and then I want to make sure that 
depending on where I see the birds hanging out, I want to make sure that there's a good spot to launch the blind from that's in pretty close proximity to where the I've seen the birds hanging out just so I don't have to walk up, you know, two miles of river to, <laughs> to get to the birds. And then uh, one of the most important things in my mind is uh, when I'm, once I've found out a good location to set up from and everything, I'll hike back to my vehicle where, you know, I have the blind and everything, and then I'll drive home just to calculate what time I'll have to wake up in the morning to get out there early enough before the birds have come in or before it's light. Uh, just cause you know, like I mentioned before, if you get out there too late, if the birds see you getting in and out of that blind or setting it up, just go home for the day because chances are you're not going to be able to get really anything. So, uh, I mean, just do the work the day before of figuring out again, where to set up, uh, where to launch and, uh, how long it takes you to get to and from where the birds are you know, where you're seeing them, where they're most likely to be, uh, what the best backgrounds are, where the sun's going to come up behind you. All that stuff are things you want to think about um, when you're, when you're uh, planning your trip. Okay. So lots of planning involved, uh, not something you can do spontaneously and expect good results anyway, huh? You might. I mean, people get lucky. So who knows, maybe uh, there's someone out there that does it that way and gets better results than me. I'm sure there is somewhere, but uh, from my experience, there's a lot of work that goes into it beforehand to, sure. uh, you know, just find out where the birds are. And uh, once you've found the birds, figure out how to get them from the blind. Okay. So do you wear a life jacket or anything or uh, you rely on the blind to support you? Yeah, I just rely on the blind. Uh, there's, I think I've only used it in one or maybe two places where the water was too deep, where my feet stopped touching the ground. And uh, I essentially was holding myself up with the blind using my arms and I would kick my legs in the water to kind of paddle along and move it. And that worked just fine, just cause there wasn't a current in that area, which, if that was the case, I wouldn't have even gone out there, but that worked just fine. And it, you know, it was a good arm and shoulder workout too. So, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, uh, it worked out. All right. Pays to be in shape then too, I guess. Huh? <laughs> um, one thing I didn't ask before is, uh, how do you keep your camera gear dry or from growing in the drink? So, uh, I think the best way to do that, honestly, and I've mentioned this a little bit before, but is just to figure out what the conditions, what the water conditions are like before you go out there. You know, I mentioned before that you want to, if it's an open body of water, you want to know if there's any like little waves or ripples in the water, things like that. And the reason I brought that up a couple times is, uh, if I get water coming up into the blind, it's generally because there's some sort of wave in the water and it comes up and splashes up through the hole that I'm standing in and it can get your gear wet. So if I'm going out and I'm, you know, I've done all the research planned, you know, where I'm going to launch from the body of water I'm going to be visiting, I'll always check the weather forecast of the next morning to uh, make sure that there's not going to be any wind that's going to cause any waves or ripples in the water, anything like that. Because from my experience, that's really the only time I've had water get up into everything is if you've got choppy waters. So if there's any wind at all, I, I just won't even go out. I'll, I'll save it for another day. Um, and if you're in a body of water that just naturally has kind of choppy water, you just probably don't want to take it out there. Uh, other than that, I do bring a dry bag to keep all my loose accessories in, all the batteries and memory cards, uh, cables, different things like that, just more so to keep those contained. But 
uh, also when I'm carrying everything out there, I do uh, cinch up that dry bag, dry bag to make sure no water gets in. But uh, other than that, I haven't found a really convenient way to uh, protect the lens and the actual camera body. If water does happen to splash up into things, I, I haven't found a convenient way to really uh, protect those. But it, like I said, it hasn't been a big issue for me if you're looking to see the water conditions, how they are and planning accordingly. Okay. So do you uh, have your uh, camera and lens on a gimbal or are you doing everything handheld? It's on a gimbal. Uh, I just took my old, one of my old tr uh, gimbal tripod heads and mounted it to the actual blind. Again, that's why I have those plywood layers so I can run a bolt through and it's not just bolted into foam. You know, I want it bolted into something solid and that's why I do the two layers of plywood on that so I can bolt my, or run a bolt through and then mount my tripod head to that. Okay, sure. Well, let's take a look at your photos. Uh, see how, see what the real see what the results look like for sure. after all this hard work. Let's see. Can you see that? Uh, hang on just a Let second. me make sure I'm sharing my screen right. Uh, nope, not so far. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So I thought I would just include a picture uh, of the actual blind. This is what it looks like floating on the water. So you can see there's a port for my camera lens to stick out of there. And I do, uh, I've, I've got that camo cover that I sewed that fits over it. And I've also got a ghillie net, a ghillie blanket that I made that I will put over it occasionally to look you know, look like dried grass or vegetation or whatever. And um, you, you don't need to have that. It's just something uh, that I do that has worked really well for me. Okay. Uh, this is a picture that I took recently of uh, Avocet in its breeding plumage. And the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to show this picture is you can see that color in the water there. Yeah. And, you know, I'm eye level with that Avocet. I got out before it was light at all. And because of that, I was able to get, you know, reflection of the uh, sunrise in the water and the birds because I was there when they started flying in. You know, they saw the, the blind there. I was already set up and they felt comfortable before the sun was even up, just all around my blind, I was able to photograph them, get that color in the water. And it was just a very, you know, beautiful, serene setting. And uh, <laughs> this was, you know, a species that is very common, but I had always wanted to photograph and not having a ton of experience in bird photography, I was pretty thrilled with being able to see and photograph these guys. Yeah, it's a beautiful bird and a beautiful photo and uh, the color in the water is wonderful. Yeah, I was very, very happy with that. Yeah, you should be. Thank you. Uh, next one, this is a grebe. And reason I wanted to show this picture is this is essentially an uncropped photo and um, this little bird, I mean, he was just teeny, just a teeny little bird, but he felt so comfortable around that blind. I almost couldn't focus on him because he was so close. And so I was able to get, you know, this extremely close image of him without having to crop and post and everything. Uh, just, you know, being able to focus on him right there outside my blind and get a photo of him. Uh, so this is just a good example of how close the birds will get to your blind if you're doing it right and how comfortable they will feel, uh, you know, next to your blind there. All right. That's a uh, pied bill grebe, I think. I believe so. Again, my bird 
identification and I mean that's not what I've focused on in the past so I'm still still yeah. getting to know a lot of these guys but I believe that's what it is so yeah wonderful de detail in the feathers and nice uh, reflection in the eye and uh, yeah out of focus background I think you nail it thank you here's another avocet uh, let me zoom in on this a little bit I really like this picture you can see, uh, he, so the Savaset was feeding in the water and, you know, they dipped their bills in, uh, kind of foraging for food in there. And just the detail that I was able to get as he was dunking his head into the water, uh, I really, really liked that. Uh, just, a, again, a beautiful bird in a beautiful setting and the color of the water that day. I had nice blue skies, so I was able to get nice blue water and it was just a gorgeous day to be out there yeah that's uh i don't think i've ever seen that behavior but uh it's very very interesting and uh, again you caught lots of detail there so it's, it's another great photo thank you uh, this was an egret i photographed a couple months ago and uh, he, this is another one, if, if I zoom in, he uh, had caught a little fish and was kind of throwing it in the air, catching it, eating it. But uh, it was just amazing watching these egrets uh, go through and catch these teeny little fish and uh, just kind of throw them up in the air. But again, this, this is a bird in my area that I've tried to photograph before and they're just very flighty around people. So to be able to have him come right up to the blind and feel comfortable there and fish and uh, be able to see that behavior was just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that's my experience as well. Egrets in general are pretty flighty, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yep. This was a black-necked stilt yep. that I, again, photographed recently uh, this last summer. And, you know, just another beautiful bird with those rosy pink legs and uh, this bird in particular, or the species in particular, I noticed this summer was incredibly skittish. Anytime I'd go out and uh, try to photograph them, they were just very skittish. So to have them, uh, you know, like the common theme here, to have them just be all around the blind without even caring was, was awesome. Great yeah. experience. Nice posture on the legs. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I skipped over that. Yeah, thank you. This is a uh, golden-eyed duck. Um, I got this guy and some of his pals this last winter, which was a fun experience because I was in the water. It was like four hours, I think, and it was, you know, 20-something degrees outside. But uh, thanks to those thick waders, I was able to stay fairly warm. And maybe the adrenaline of photographing these guys <laughs> helped me to stay warm. But... Uh, golden eyed ducks. I've always noticed them along a local river trail, and I've always wanted to photograph them, but they've always been uh, just so quick to fly away as soon as anybody goes by. But uh, this was one of the first times I took the blind out to specifically photograph birds and not, you know, the otters or beavers or whatever. And uh, I, it was just an amazing experience out with these guys i spent a couple days out with them and it was just it was great to have them all around me and finally be able to get some pictures of them after quite a few attempts at uh, or failed attempts of not using a blind trying to get them yeah beautiful birds again yeah, they're, uh, they're a lot of fun. And I, this image particularly I liked with the water coming off of his yep. bill there. And it was just fun experience. Uh, here we've got a pelican and I wanted to include this just because he's in flight and those blinds using them, it can be a little bit tricky. You know, most of my picture or all of the other pictures I've shown so far has been the bird on the water, uh, you know, swimming around me or eating, whatever it is. But uh, these pelicans were flying around me a couple weeks ago when I took the blind out. And I 
wanted to include this picture just to show that you can get pretty crisp pictures uh, while, or, you know, in flight pictures while using the blind as well, if you've got everything set up. So you're not just limited to what's right in front of you. You can take uh, flight pictures as well in these blinds. Oh, very nice. Thank you. We've got a lot of those in our area and I uh, always love taking flight photos of them. Yeah, they're beautiful. This was a white-faced ibis uh, that, oh, I believe it's white-faced ibis. Looks um, like it to me anyway. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was just kind of scratching his face and neck with his foot there. I thought it was a cool picture. The light that day was just beautiful. And the summer was just so fun because I saw so many new species and was able to photograph them, species that I've never photographed before or spent time with uh, before. And this blind just allowed me to get out with so many new species. And this was one of them. And I just, I had a blast with these guys the morning that I went out with them. Just a beautiful bird. Yeah, if the light catches them right, their feathers are iridescent and they just yeah. really glow. Yep. Yeah, just gorgeous. You can see that a little bit in this picture in the wing. I've got some other pictures where you it just really pops though, and it's just you know beautiful, beautiful birds. Yep. Uh, this I actually photographed just the same day as that ibis. Uh, I've been wanting to photograph these guys for a while now. Uh, this is a my mind's blanking grebe as well. West, I believe Western grebe. Yeah. Yep. And. Uh, you know, he was a little wary of the blind at first, but he warmed up to it once he realized it wasn't chasing him or whatever. And uh, I got to watch him look for food around the blind for a little while. And uh, it was just a great, great experience. Got a nice portrait shot of him here. So. Have you ever seen them dancing? No, that's, that's so high on my bucket list. Yeah. I would love to see that sometime. Just beautiful uh, yeah. behavior. I got some pictures, not great pictures, I'd have to say, because the water was a little rough, but uh, got some pictures of them dancing. It's uh, really a fun experience and uh, fun to photograph. So That's awesome. Good for you. That I, I'd love to see those uh, because that's, yeah, behavior that I, I've always wanted to see. People can get some pretty cool pictures of that. So. Right. And last one that I wanted to show was this uh, golden eye again, just flapping his wings. And, you know, I'm right there on eye level with him. And uh, you can see some of the snow in the background. So this was another cold winter morning out with that blind, but going into uh, or working towards my goal of photographing these golden eye ducks, my, uh, goal photo was to get one of them flapping their wings like this. So uh, this was one of the last pictures I took when I was out there with them. So I was just thrilled to be able to check that off the list and I'll go out for them again this winter, I think, and see what I can get. But, you know, just awesome birds, awesome behavior, and to have them act completely naturally around the blind uh, was just fantastic. Great experience. Yeah. Again, the pictures of, uh, with the uh, water droplets uh, coming off the bird adds a lot too. Yeah, I was quite happy with that. <laughs> yeah, as you should be. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing those. Those are all wonderful. I, I'm envious. Yeah, of, course. of course. So tell everybody where to find you and everything you do. I know you've got a vlog, which I... Uh, I think I've got most of those episodes uh, linked, to, which I'll link uh, to in the uh, video and uh, awesome. also in the uh, in the show notes. But uh, where where else can people find you? Yeah, so my website is jimmybreitenstein.com. The spelling on that's pretty tricky. So uh, yeah, if you're putting that in the uh, show notes. That sure. would be helpful just because sure. I can't even spell it half the time. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, that's my website. Don't judge it too critically. I'm doing a major overhaul on my website right now. And so a couple months from now, it's going to look quite different. But uh, yeah, it's my website. And then I'm on Instagram 
at Jimmy B underscore into the wild. And I am also on YouTube. Uh, if you just search Jimmy Breitenstein, I come out with weekly videos there uh, revolving around the wildlife that I spend time with and photograph and all uh, go over photography tips and uh, gear that I use, different things like that as well. Okay, great. Well, lots of good info as usual. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge and experience and uh, using floating blinds. Uh, not as easy as it sounds from uh, what you're telling me. It's rewarding though. Put the work in and it's, it's an amazing experience. And yeah. Once you do it a couple times and get it down, it, it's a lot easier than that first time or two. Yeah, for sure. So this podcast is published on the 15th and 30th of the month. Usually we're a little late this time, but uh, uh, between my schedule and Jimmy's, uh, this was the best we can do. And uh, I uh, saw his uh, blog about uh, folding blinds. So I wanted to get him on and uh, get a little more detail about it. So we'll be back on October 15th. Thanks for listening and watching and bye for now.